Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome back for part two of the minerals presentation. So before we had our break, we were discussing the three types of bonds that we, t we found in minerals. So these were of course, ionic, covalent and metallic. And in all those three instances, they required the exchange of an electron, which essentially produced a strong bond between the atoms. Now, in this instance, we're going to talk about intermolecular forces. So we're going to talk about hydrogen bonds, dipole, dipole, and van der Waals forces. Now, these are forces, as the name says. They are not bonds. An electron has not been exchanged. These are simply attractive forces. Now, these attractive forces are going to help the unit cells of minerals to orientate themselves. We'll see that in a second with the hydrogen bonding. So these forces can't be uh, ignored because they will affect how the unit cell is shaped, how it stacks, and it's also going to affect the physical properties of the minerals in some cases. So, you know, what's going on at a molecular level is going to be reflected in the mineral in a physical level and a macro level when you hold it in your hand. So in the case of intermolecular forces, the strongest intermolecular force are hydrogen bonds. So in the case of a hydrogen bond, what we have is we have an attraction between oxygen and hydrogen. So if we just go back for a second to the previous slide, we were looking at water molecules. We were discussing how water molecules have the electronegative oxygen and the two electropositive hydrogens. And we noticed that when we look at the distribution of electrons in a water molecule, we'll see most of the electrons were pulled towards the electronegative oxygen, whilst the electropositive hydrogens were essentially you know, electron poor. And so they were acting as they were acting as the positive ends. Now, what this means is, is when you have a molecule that contains water or the OH group, you will have hydrogen bonds. And a hydrogen bond will simply result in the uh, hydrogens, which are electropositive, orientating themselves towards another atom, which is electronegative. So in this case, we're just looking at water, and we can see that the oxygen atoms are orientated to face a hydrogen. Oxygen to hydrogen, oxygen to hydrogen, oxygen to hydrogen, and so on and so on and so on. And so what we can see is the molecules have arranged themselves to essentially positive to negative, as you would expect. And so, of course, this is a relatively strong attraction because oxygen is very, very electronegative and the hydrogen, because the electrons are being pulled away from it, is quite electropositive. And so when you start freezing water, this is what happens. You'll find the water molecules will orientate themselves and they'll lock into this hexagonal form. In fact, if you actually have an empty uh, tub or semi-empty tub of ice cream in the back of your freezer, if you reach back there and pull the lid off, you'll see the lid is covered with lots and lots of uh, bits of ice. If you look very, very carefully at those pieces of ice, you'll actually see there are lots and lots of hexagonal plates. So that's, you know, that's this shape being reflected in the crystals that you see on the lid of your ice cream container. So, yeah, these hydrogen bonds are rather common because OH groups, this group here, is very, very common in minerals. And so the electronegative oxygen, the electropositive hydrogen, will to some degree affect the shape of the unit cell and how the unit cells will stack because, of course, the hydrogen is going to try and orientate itself to face some kind of electronegative atom may not be the oxygen, there could be something else in the molecule that's electronegative, but it will try and orientate itself to face that electronegative atom. And so that's obviously going to affect how your unit cell is shaped and how it stacks. And of course, that can then have, a, can have an effect on a larger scale. For instance, it can then produce some kind of plane of weakness, maybe, along which your mineral can preferentially split. So essentially, it can end up forming cleavage. So anyway, First of the intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonds. Now remember, this has to be between oxygen and hydrogen. So if it's not between oxygen and hydrogen, it's referred to as dipole-dipole. So it's the same as a hydrogen bond, only the electropositive atom isn't hydrogen. Now dipole-dipole is most commonly seen in mica minerals. So if you remember, mica minerals were those minerals that you could peel. You could, just like you know, turning a page in a book. Each individual page was quite strong and flexible, but you could peel one page from another, and it was the same in a mica mineral. You could peel it off to form these sheets of very strong, flexible, you know, biotite or muscovite, but the contact between the sheets was essentially was a very weak plane along which they would naturally split. 
and there's a reason for that. So the sheets of mica themselves are here and they consist of aluminum, silicon and oxygen all bonded together with nice strong covalent bonds. So, you know, they're not going to fail very easily. However, between these nice strong sheets, we have these potassium ions right here in blue. Now they've got a positive charge. The oxygens here have a negative charge. So obviously they're going to orientate themselves to face one another. The thing is, is once again, there's no actual bond between the potassiums here and the oxygens here. So that means when you come along and you decide you're going to split your crystal of biotite open and peel it along one of these weaknesses, that's exactly what you're doing. As you, put, as you rip the mineral apart, you are tearing it along one of these faces here that has this dipole-dipole attraction. Because it's so weak, you can physically split the mineral along it with the bare minimum of effort. In the case of van der Waals forces, well, van der Waals forces occur when you have atoms, once again, not bonded to each other, no electron has been exchanged, and they move within five nanometers of each other. So one nanometer is that. So they got to get pretty close. So the interaction at that kind of level means that the nucleus of one atom, which is positively charged because it has the protons in it, will start to attract the electrons of the adjacent atom. <coughs> Excuse me. So the electrons over here are pulled towards the nucleus over here. And so this means that you have a very, very weak attractive force. Uh, van der Waals forces are most commonly seen in minerals like graphite. So in the case of graphite, once again, it's like a book. Each sheet of graphite consists of carbon atoms, which are held together by covalent bonds. So it's a very, very strong layer. However, because all the carbons in this sheet essentially have exchanged electrons, there's no electrons to exchange between layers. So that means each layer in this graphite crystal essentially is only very, very weakly attracted to the layer above and the layer below, and the attraction is due to van der Waals forces. And so that means when you take your pencil and you drag it across your sheet of paper, obviously your pencil, is, pencil lead is made from graphite, as you drag it across your sheet of paper, what's happening is, is the force of you moving the pencil over the sheet of paper is literally ripping the graphite apart along these planes of weakness between the sheets. So once again, it's failing along the planes of the van der, with van der Waals forces because they're a natural weakness. And so hydrogen bonds, dipole, dipole, sorry, hydrogen, sorry, uh, hydrogen bonds, dipole, dipole, and van der Waals intermolecular forces typically produce planes of weakness along which your mineral will preferentially split. So they are quite important in affecting how your mineral will behave at a macro scale. Okay, so the most important thing is, well, how do we actually separate minerals? So we're through the boring stuff, now let's yeah, go on to some more fun stuff. So if we try and split minerals apart based on things like physical properties, like color, well, that doesn't tend to work because when it comes to minerals, very, very small vari variations in composition can have a very significant effect on how your mineral actually appears. So that doesn't really work. So instead, what we do is we classify minerals based on their chemical composition. And the chemical composition has allowed us to split minerals into two broad groups. There's the silicates and the non-silicates. So the silicates are about 90% of all minerals on Earth, and they consist of such you know, you know, common silicate minerals of things like olivine, pyroxene, amphibole, plagioclase, quartz, feldspar, etc., etc. And silicate minerals can be split into two other broad subgroups. There are the ferromagnesian and the non-ferromagnesian silicate minerals. So the ferromagnesium silicate minerals are those which are rich in iron and magnesium, and that tends to give them quite a dark color. So olivine, pyroxene, and amphibole tend to be quite darkly colored minerals, and so they're probably quite rich in, ferrum, in iron and magnesium, so we would classify them as ferromagnesium. In contrast, plagioclase, quartz, and feldspar, I should say potassium feldspar, are quite light minerals, and so you would classify those as non-ferromagnesium, so iron and magnesium poor. In terms of the non-silicates, well, they're typically what we refer to as accessory minerals. They'll only make up a very, very small proportion of most rocks. However, when they turn up in quite large quantities, things like the oxides, the sulfides, the sulfates, the phosphates, the borates, the tungstates, and the native elements are all 
minerals that we use essentially to extract metals. So they're major ore minerals. All right, so now let's have a quick discussion about how we define each group. So as discussed, it's based on the chemical formula. And in front of you, you have an absolute sea of color. So let's actually try and work out what we're talking about here. So right at the top, we have the silicates. So the silicate is any mineral that has silicon bonded to oxygen. Now, the amounts of silicon and oxygen will vary. In this case, we have one silicon and four oxygens. In this case, we have one silicon and five oxygens. Sometimes it's one silicon and two oxygens. Sometimes it's two silicons and six oxygens. The moral of the story is, as long as you have silicon bonded to oxygen, it's going to be a silicate. So, relatively easy one to spot. The carbonates are also easy to spot. Look for the CO3 group. Okay, if your mineral has a CO3 group in it, it's a carbonate. Oxides. An oxide is when you have your metal bonded to oxygen by itself. So in this case, you can see we have three oxygens, here we have four, and here we have two, depending on the mineral. So the amount of oxygen is variable, but as long as you have a metal bonded to oxygen by itself, you have an oxide. The hydroxides are where we have a metal bonded to an OH group. The composition is always OH, there's no variation in the number of oxygens or hydrogens. Then we have the halides, that's when we have a metal bonded to a halogen. So if you remember, the halogens are fluorine, chlorine, iodine, and bromine. And uh, typically it will be chlorine is the most common of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the elements which will appear. And you'll get it in things like table salt, halite, you'll get it in sylvite, and here we have the mineral uh, fluoride. So, yeah, as long as you have a metal bonded to a halogen, chlorine, fluorine, bromine, or iodine, you have a halide. Then we have the sulfides. So, as you'll notice here, there, you'll notice here there are two different spellings. This is the North American spelling, this is the United Kingdom spelling. So, in this case, you'll see we have a metal, so iron, zinc, copper, bonded to sulfur by itself. So once again, the, the amount of sulfur is variable. You could have one, two, three, four, five, etc. But just as long as you have sulfur by itself bonded to a metal, you have a sulfide. In the case of the sulfates, once again, North American, United Kingdom, uh, you have an SO4 group. The composition of that doesn't change. It's always SO4. So if you can find that SO4 group, so you've got a metal bonded to an SO4 group, it's going to be a sulfate. Phosphates, it's the PO4 group. Once again, composition of that never changes. Borates, it's boron bonded to oxygen. So you can see the amount of boron and oxygen does change. Here it's four borons, uh, seven oxygens. Here it's seven borons, 13 oxygens. So in this case, you're going to look for a metal bonded to a boron oxygen group. Tungstates, it's a tungsten oxygen group, WO4. And then we have the native elements, and the native elements are simply metals that appear, occur by themselves, so gold, silver, copper, etc. So, as you can see, this works wonderfully when you have relatively simple chemical formulas, where you just have one group. Now, what happens if we have a slightly more complex mineral? So, here we go. So, here's our mineral, and you can see it is an extremely complex uh, chemical formula. But you'll notice here we have silicon and oxygen, so that's one group, so that's a silicate group. We have the PO4, so that's going to be a phosphate group. We have the CO3, that's obviously a carbonate group. And then we have the SO3, which we didn't discuss above, that's the sulfite group. There aren't many sulfite minerals out there, so we don't really worry about them. So the question is, is how do we classify this mineral? Do we classify it as a silicate, a phosphate, a carbonate, or a sulfate? And the answer is, is when you look at the order of them, typically the one at the front, or should I say the one on the left, the first one will be the group with which, you know, with which we classify the mineral. So in this case, we would classify it as a silicate. Okay, And that works in the vast majority of cases. So when you have a complex formula like this, the first group that appears, that's the group you're going to use to classify the mineral. Okay, so the next question is, well, where do these minerals actually occur? Well, silicates, the answer is pretty much everywhere. Okay, they're ninety percent of you know all minerals, and so you know they'll occur in most rocks, apart from you know ones that are, you know are produced in situations where there are very limited chemistries. Carbonates, on the other hand, well, carbonates commonly form in marine environments. 
So the vast majority of carbonates are going to be found in the rocks limestone, or well, in the rock limestone and dollar stone. And typically, you know, carbonates will only form in environments where you have a lot of dissolved calcium carbonate in the system, and that typically produces animals that have calcium carbonate rich shells. So once again, marine environments. So think of things like oysters. So the calcium carbonate gets stripped out of the water, used to make shells, and obviously when that animal dies, its shell gets incorporated into the sediment, and then that goes, you know, when you've got lots and lots of shells in the sediment, that eventually goes on to form a limestone. You can also get carbonates forming through hydrothermal processes where you have hot water circulating in the crust, but they're, you know, a much smaller percentage of total carbonates. The vast majority of carbonates forms in the ocean. Halides, sulfates, and borates, well, I've lumped them together here because they all tend to occur in the same environment. Now, we've covered the group, so we're not going to worry about those too much. But in terms of when they uh, actually occur, halides, sulfates, and borates are commonly associated with evap well, evaporite conditions. So that's when we have a restricted body of water. So think of a, a lake in the desert. Now, obviously, the body of water is going to be evaporating very, very quickly because of all the heat. So your body of water is evaporating away. There's not enough water coming into your lake to refill it fast enough, so you have a net loss. The problem is, is that as the water evaporates away, it can't take the stuff dissolved in the water with it. Okay, so if you've ever owned a kettle in which you've boiled, you know, local Houston water, you'll know that, you know, relatively quickly it starts to fill up with lime scale. So lime scale is just calcium carbonate. And the lime scale is produced, well, the lime scale is the result of the calcium carbonate dissolved in the tap water. So as the tap water boils away and goes into the atmosphere as water vapor, the calcium carbonate that was dissolved in it gets left behind on the inside of your kettle in the form of lime scale. And that's exactly what happens in these evaporite environments. As the lake evaporates away, all the stuff that's dissolved in the water, well, it can't go with the water as it turns into a gas, so it has to be left behind. And eventually, once enough water has evaporated away, it's going to start forming discrete crystals. And the minerals you'll tend to get in these situations is you'll tend to get um, the uh, halides and the sulfates. And if you happen to have fresh water evaporating away, you will also get the borates appearing. Okay? So if you have salt water, marine water of uh, um, evaporating away, you'll tend to get lots and lots of, ha lots and lots of halides, lots and lots of sulfates. And if you have fresh water evaporating away, you will also get the borates appearing. In the case of the oxides, the oxides are pretty much everywhere. They're a very, very common um, accessory mineral. The only place they won't really occur are in the evaporite, so you won't get oxides occurring with these minerals up here. If you happen to get the oxides in significant concentrations, that's when you have something you can actually mine and extract the metal from. So uh, iron ore, the stuff we get iron from, is a, is a you know, range of oxide minerals. So you just dig it out of the ground, throw it in the smelter, and extract the iron. Next we have the sulfide. So that's when we have our metal bonded just to sulfur. Now sulfides, once again, are common accessory minerals. However, just like the oxides, if you can get them in large enough concentrations, they are very economically valuable. So, you know, the primary ore minerals for copper, zinc, lead, and a whole range of other metals are sulfide minerals. Now, sulfide minerals have to form in low oxygen environments. The reason for that is, is if, they, if you try and form a sulfide in an environment when there's oxygen around, well, the sulfur will naturally react with the oxygen and it will give you a sulfate. So the presence of sulfides in your rock tends to indicate that the amount of oxygen around was quite low. In the case of the hydroxides, well, the hydroxides are found in a range of different environments, but hydroxide minerals are actually quite rare. The OH group is very, very common in a whole range of different minerals. However, it's only a very, very minor constituent. Finding a mineral that you know, exclusively consists of a metal bonded to an OH group is actually quite difficult. And they tend to occur in environments where you have lots and lots and lots of water hitting a rock. So the classic example of that is an equatorial region, 
where you have an exposed granite. In case you have warm, you have warm air combined with lots of lots and lots of rainfall, and essentially the combination of those two factors results in the minerals in your granite breaking down very very quickly, reacting with all that water, and you end up forming these hydroxide minerals. So something like gibbsite, which is one of the primary ore minerals for uh, aluminum. So hydroxides, hydroxide minerals aren't actually that common you only tend to get them under relatively limited conditions. Phosphates and tungstates, well, they're relatively common accessory minerals in igneous metamorphic and hydrothermal rocks. You don't really tend to get them in sedimentary rocks that much. And once again, if they occur in large quantities, they're economically important. Uh, phosph uh, phosphates are actually quite important to us because one of the most common phosphate minerals is a mineral called apatite, it's calcium phosphate, and it's the stuff that our bones are made from. So our bones are made from hydroapatite, and so obviously, you know, phosphate, quite important. And in terms of the native elements, the native elements are simply formed by any element which doesn't really want to bond itself to a group. So that's things like, you know, the unreactive elements, gold, platinum, palladium, iridium, osmium, ruthenium, rhodium, silver, and you can also get copper and sulfur in that as well. And so these are metals, ele atoms, sorry, the elements that will just occur by themselves and are not bonded to one of the groups that we just covered. Okay, so now we have to start thinking about when we have a mineral, how do we actually work out what mineral it is? And that, you know, that's a pretty difficult question. Unless you've had training, you know, most minerals would land in front of you. You would go, oh, that's great. And you would pretty much wouldn't be able to work out what it is from there because there are quite a few gray minerals in this world. So now let's have a think about what we actually use to work out what our mineral is. So the first thing we're going to use are things called diagnostic features. And these are things about our mineral which are distinct to that mineral only. And there are eight main diagnostic features that we use. Color, that's obvious. Luster, that's how the light plays off the surface of the mineral. Crystal habit, what shape does the crystal take? Hardness, well that one's obvious. Cleavage, are there planes of weakness in our mineral along which it will preferentially split? Fracture, if you you know, if our mineral splits not along any kind of plane of weakness, just splits, what kind of surface do we get when it splits? Specific gravity. How dense is our mineral? How much does it weigh? How does it feel when you pick it up? Light, heavy. And then streak. If we take our mineral and we grind it across a ceramic plate, what colour does it leave behind? There are also uh, four other uh, factors which we can use to help work out what our mineral is. There's effervescence, does our mineral react with hydrochloric acid? Magnetism, that one's pretty self-explanatory. Exolution and twinning. Now we'll cover these two later on, so I'm not going to worry about what they are right now. So okay, so let's start with colour. Well, the problem with colour is, is that very, very small changes in the composition and the chemical composition of your mineral will lead to significant changes in color so here we go so here's quartz okay now the quartz we're all used to are those beautiful you know colorless crystals that we saw all the way back on like you know the sixth or seventh slide you know you had this love had that lovely crystal the quartz it was all you know clear and you know wonderfully transparent however it, you know you probably know that a lot of quartz occurs as you know has different colors so for instance here we have milky quartz Milky quartz is the result of lots and lots of fluid inclusions, they're called. Lots of very small bubbles of fluid trapped within the crystal. And all these little bubbles of fluid give the crystal a rather cloudy look. So here we have rose quartz. So rose quartz is the result of an inclusion of a titanium mineral inside, the, in, w along with the quartz crystal. And it gives it this rather distinct pink colour. Here we have citrine, which you can see has this rather distinct yellow colour to it, and that's due to an iron impurity in the quartz crystal. And here we have amethyst. Well, amethyst is also due to an iron impurity, but that iron impurity has been lightly irradiated, and it causes it to turn purple. So very, very small changes in chemical composition and very, very small changes in the environment in which the crystal forms can result in you know, rather significant changes in colour. 
So using color as a diagnostic feature is normally not that good. Now there are rare circumstances where using color is actually quite efficient. So you know there are some minerals that have rather rare colors. So something like the mineral kyanite. The mineral kyanite is blue. There aren't many blue minerals out there. So when you see a blue colored mineral you know your choices are limited. So in that instance color can be helpful. But for most minerals color is not that useful. Now each of these different minerals here all have the same composition. It's all quartz. It's all SiO2. Milky quartz, rose quartz, citrine, amethyst. It's all quartz. The only difference between them is the color. And so what we do is we call these varieties. So each variety has a slightly different chemical composition resulting in a slightly different color. If a mineral does not have any color it's called colorless. So the next thing we're going to look at is luster. So luster simply refers to the character of light reflected by the sample. Now it should be noted that luster when we talk about it is based on you know really nice well formed crystals that look really good. So if you get a bit of a you know a rubbish looking crystal the luster may not be you know what you would like it to be. But when it really comes down to it there are only a few lusters that you will actually come across. Now you'll see a few of the lusters here are highlighted. So there's four of them. The first luster is referred to as a dull or earthy luster. And that's relatively straightforward. There's no luster. It just simply looks like a, you know, a handful of dirt. And this is very commonly associated with uh, clay minerals. You know, they, they don't really have luster. You know, they just look kind of dirt, dirt-like, really, for one of a better way of describing it. Then we have minerals that have a metallic luster. And that's when they look like polished metal. The light bounces off the surface. Okay. Now that's going to be minerals, things like py pyrite, which is iron sulfide, also called fool's gold, and galena, which is a, a lead sulfide mineral. They have, they're both very, very metallic. Then we have pearly lusters, and that's when minerals are made of thin sheets. So this is going to be something like the micas. And what happens is, is the light reflects in these layers, giving a pearly appearance. Now, uh, adamantine, greasy, and resinous, we're not really going to discuss. Same with silky, submetallic, and waxy. But then there's arguably the most common of all the lusters, which is vitreous. So there's a very, very good chance that if you can't classify your mineral as having either an earthy luster, a metallic luster, or a pearly luster, you are going to classify it as a vitreous luster because most silicates have vitreous lusters and as silicates make up the vast majority of minerals chances are it's going to be a silicate okay even you know even non-silicates have a vitreous luster things like you know calcite which is a you know, the most common carbonate mineral will also have a vitreous luster in the case of a vitreous luster the the, the light is going to reflect off the surface like it was glass now, that doesn't mean it, you know, like a, like a pane of glass, the light's going to just pass straight through it. Sometimes you'll get that, but not all the time. A vitreous luster can also mean, for instance, if you had a, uh, a, a block of glass, okay, a block of slightly cloudy glass. So if we just go back a second to the uh, milky quartz crystal here, you'll notice the light isn't going to pass through it. It's not, not like the citrine crystal here. The citrine crystal, the light's going to pass through it. It really looks like glass, doesn't it? Same with the, the amethyst over here, and even the rose quartz over here has a very glassy look to it. In contrast, the milky quartz here doesn't really have the same kind of glassy appearance because of you know it's so cloudy inside. However, the light is still going to reflect off the surface, and it's going to have that slightly kind of glassy look to it. So even though the light can't pass through it, the light bouncing off the surface will still look as if you had a, a block of, would look like if you had a, a block of frosted glass, essentially. And so there are lots of minerals which are not transparent, so the light won't pass through them, but they will have this kind of appearance where you know the light will bounce off the surface and it will look kind of as if you had a, a block of a uh, block of, you know, uh, block of glass. Okay. In terms of crystal habit, once again, there are many, many different crystal habits out there. However, the main ones you would come across would be cubic, 
and you can pretty much work out what a cubic crystal is going to look like. It's going to look like a cube, isn't it? Massive crystals, well, that's when we have just a whole pile of crystals which have no real shape to them. There's no distinct crystal shape. They're all just massed together, and that's referred to as a massive situation, a massive habit. Then we have prismatic crystals. They are elongate, so they're long and sometimes slender, sometimes a bit chunkier. And then we have platy crystals. So that's where crystals have a kind of almost a, uh, a book-like appearance to them. You can see the crystals made up of lots and lots of individual layers, and these layers are flat. Okay, so once again, as you can see, there's a whole range of different crystal habits that, you know, if you go on Wikipedia and look at the crystal habit page, you will see there are even more than this. But these four are the main ones, cubic, massive, prismatic, and platy. So just to give you some idea, by the way, of, uh, of what prismatic crystals look like, they have this very long, slender form. Okay. So this is a good place to stop. So once again, stop the video, get up, have a walk around, glass of water, come back in five or ten minutes and start part three.